traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. Uh, so now, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Dale. Uh, Dr. Dale Anderson is a friend and supporter of Florida Veterans for Common Sense. Uh, he's been working with us for some time, and he's uh, really uh, been one of those people that are very admirable because he saw the problem that was arising when Trump started to uh, run for office. And before Trump even had office, Dr. Anderson was looking into the threat by Trump to our democracy. And he reached, researched that and really has become an expert on fascism and how fascism slowly moves into democracies and then ultimately uh, takes it over. So uh, it's a model for all of us. That kind of behavior is to see a problem, then educate ourselves about it, and then even better, do something about it by organizing a group and uh, a grassroots organization, which is working very close with us. He, he helps us a lot uh, with some of our outreach programs, et, et cetera. So a little bit of background on Dr. Anderson. He's a physician. He's practiced internal and emergency med medicine. He was a CEO of a large Midwestern medical group practice. He was a hospital executive in a large health system in New Mexico and Ohio. And he's also consulted with a Miami-based healthcare strategy company. He received his undergraduate degree from Iowa State University of Business and he received his MD from Northwestern University. And uh, he's just one of those individuals that we're very proud to be associated with, and he does terrific work. So Dr. Anderson, it's your forum. Thank you, thank you. I'll share my screen now and, all right. So I've been thinking about this for five years, this issue of is, is Trump and the MAGA party at a fascist movement or what is it? And I think Americans have been uh, confused on this issue for this entire time. I think there's still great confusion in terms of what Trump is and what that party is. And uh, a lot of the confusion has been caused not only by uh, the party itself, but by some of the um, fascism experts that have weighed in on this issue over time. So I'm gonna walk through a little bit of that history. Uh, you know, I think, that we would all agree that our democracy is in trouble. Um, you know, we've had the uh, January 6th insurrection. There's 30% of Americans believe that the 2020 election was stolen and our recent crisis over state classified documents being stolen and hidden in Mar-a-Lago. I would say that's uh, enough evidence that our democracy is in trouble. And it was, it was good to see that President Biden stepped forward uh, several weeks ago to make it evident that he recognizes that and he wanted to make sure the entire country understood that. So many of you probably saw his battle for the soul of our nation speech on September 1st from Independence Hall. He said, as I stand here today, equality and democracy are under assault. We do ourselves no favor to pretend otherwise. And the other interesting thing was it was just, um, you know, several weeks before, or about a week before that, when he was on, uh, doing a uh, speech uh, on, a, on a tour, he said, what we're now seeing is either the beginning or the death knell of extreme MAGA philosophy. And he said, it's not just Trump, it's the entire philosophy that underpins it. And he said, I'm going to say something, it's like semi-fascism. And he made the statement, probably the first time a president has thrown that word out towards another party in a great many years. Of course, the, uh, the right wing uh, went uh, into a meltdown on a Sunday morning. Of course, many, many may have heard or seen Chris Sununu, uh, New Hampshire governor, make the statement that uh, that president compared the Make America Great Again, otherwise known as MAGA wing of the Republican Party to semi-fascism. And he said, told CNN's Dana Bash, 
on the State of the Union that the president comments were horribly insulting and he needed to apologize to the Republican party. So did the president apologize? This goes way back to 2016 when Trump first arrived on the scene. And I think early on, people recognized that, that he had all the characteristics of a fascist leader. Um, Robert Kagan from the Brookings Institute, this was back in May of 2016, wrote, this is how fascism yeah. comes to America, not with jackboots and salutes, although there have been salutes and a whiff of violence, but with a television huckster, a phony billionaire, a textbook egomaniac tapping into popular resentments and insecurities, and with an entire national party out of ambition or blind loyalty or simply out of fear, falling in line behind him. And the Washington Post uh, published this list where they had gone out and spoken to some uh, experts on fascism and they asked, asked them to score Donald Trump on these fascist traits and they came up with these 10 traits and they, it was, they were to score them on a scale of, of zero to four. They called them Benitos or Benito Mussolini score points. And you can see they gave him uh, hyper-nationalism, two points. And this is, this is the Washington Post um, scoring after, after they had done the interviews. Militarism, glor glorification of violence, fetishization of youth, mas fetishization of masculinity, leadership cult. You can see the numbers and he scored 26 out of 44. Uh, interesting, I think if we were to go back and score him after six years, uh, his score would be closer, at least I scored it, it was closer about 39 to 40 out of 44. But there was early recognition that this was really looked like a fascist uh, leader and a fascist um, political movement. And then things got mixed up and the controversy over whether Trump was a fascist or not got very confusing. I just went back and, and uh, did a screenshot of some of the articles when you just put in, is Trump a fascist? And you can kind of see the levels of, of disparity. So um, the first one, Bloomberg says, to defend democracy, don't call Trump a semi-fascist. And that was in 2022. Back in 2020, uh, is Trump a fas fascist? Ex eight experts weigh in. I'm going to give more information on that specific article in a minute. Uh, and then Trump is not a fascist, but that doesn't make him any less dangerous. That was 2021. Why you should stop calling Donald Trump a fascist from the Washington Post. Foreign policy, don't call Trump a fascist. It's finally time to begin calling Trump a fascism. That's 2021. You can see that just going down there, there's this whole list. Um, why is, why is it finally time about time to talk about a fascist government that's a Milwaukee independent? So these articles are going back and forth for really the past six years. One of the most outspoken um, people that when I first started looking into fascism, fascism was Umar Haik, who is an, I'm an entrepreneur, businessman. He's now a writer. He publishes on that site called Medium. And he's been the most critical of the United States uh, lack of understanding about fascism. And he said back in 2017, Orwell once said, the hardest thing is to see what's right before one's nose. He went on to say, in my life, I don't think I've ever seen a society's intellectuals, pundits and leaders get anything wrong as America's got the rise of fascism. America needs to wake up. Fascism exists for a reason. And this is very interesting, to ration the dwindling fruits of a stagnant economy. And this is a very important thought that as, as a economy either believes it's collapsing and that resources are gonna get tighter, that factions come together in order to try and, and um, preserve their position and preserve their resources. Capitalism is imploding into fascism. And he says the entire set of ideas regarding our descent into fascism is still absolutely un unmentionable in polite society. You won't read it in the New York Times and nobody on CNN will say it. And that's the word fascism really didn't appear in a cable news site 
for at least the first uh, four, three or four years. If you don't name it or call it what it is, you can't effectively deal with it, fascism. So then this article uh, showed up in Vox in October of 2020. It was a Dylan Matthews interview with fascism experts. And the experts he interviewed have, have written those books that are shown here. So you have uh, Robert Paxton, The Anatomy of Fascism, Stanley Payne, A History of Fascism, Sherry Berman, Democracy and Dictatorships, The Nature of Fascism. So he went out and found the academics that have been studying fascism and writing on it for, for decades. And the, of the eight experts, look on the right there, it says, those are the experts and where they went, uh, where they're associated with. Only Jason Stanley gave a partial yes to the question of, was this a fascist movement or Trump a fascist? So I'm gonna go through kind of what their thinking was on that. So first person was um, Robert Paxton who wrote Anatomy of Fascism, famous book, and he's considered one of the, the leaders in fascism. And he said, I stand by what I've already written about Trump. He's not a fascist and fascism. But there is one change, he said, I'm struck now with Trump's growing willingness to employ physical violence. He said before Trump was already willing to tolerate some roughing up of hecklers at rallies and his encouragement of, a, of the locker up refrain was clearly transgressive. Uh, but now he says after Charlottesville, we have the Proud Boys and the aggression against the governor of Michigan. So Trump gets closer to having his own SA, the Nazi paramilitary group, a sobering thought as the election approaches. Remember, this is in October of 20. But then he says, but it's still, there is still no state management of the economy here, as there was to a degree in Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. So I think terms like oligarchy and plutocracy work for Trump with the added thought that he is close to crossing the line with his toleration of violence. So despite everything that was known, he still came down on the side that this wasn't. Roger Griffin, one of the, another famous um, academic said, his Trump's relationship to democracy, I would really insist, is the key to answering whether he's a fascist or not. Even in four years of incoherent and inconsistent tweets, he's never actually done a Putin and tried to make himself a permanent president. And remember, this is October <laughs> before uh, the January 6th, right? Let alone suggest any coherent plan for overthrowing the constitutional system. And I don't even think that that's in his mind. He's an exploiter, a freeloader. He's a wheeler and dealer. And that's not the same as an ideologue. So he's absolutely not a fascist. He doesn't pose a challenge to our constitutional democracy. He certainly poses a great challenge to liberalism and liberal democracy. And I think real favor will be served by journalists who instead of seeing liberal democracy as a single entity, see it as binomial. Democracy can exist without liberalism. Basically, I think it matters whether we call Trump fascist or not, not academically or intellectually, but because it's a red herring, it actually diverts attention from where we should be doing the critique. If all our intellectual energies are like Don Quixote, Jousting with windmills and fascism instead of actually jousting with the real enemies of democracy and using our energies to avert the climate crisis, which is going to engulf us all. If we're not careful, then we're wasting our time. Sherry Berman uh, from Columbia said on Trump and fascism, unlike what has become an almost majority view, I do not like applying the term to Trump or to what's going on in this country. That Trump maintains his support by engaging in explicitly divisive appeals designed to pit groups against each other, particularly but not exclusively ethnic groups, also, of course, bears some similarity to what fascism is. And of course, Trump is undermining various norms and institutions of democracy, but that doesn't make him a fascist, which, is, which means much more than these things. Um, Professor Ben Gott said she favored authoritarian over fascism because she said, in the 21st century, fascist takeovers have been replaced by rulers who come to power through elections and then over time extinguish freedoms. I think she'd forgotten that both Mussolini and Hitler were um, initially elected into their positions. 
And, and then you had Jason Brownlee who said it didn't fit with the traditional ideas. Finally, Jason Stanley, uh, the one person who said something that made sense said, when I think about fascism, I think about it as applied to different things. There's a fascist regime. We do not have a fascist regime. Then there's the question, is Trump, Trumpism a fascist social and political movement? I think you could legitimately call Trumpism a fascist social and political movement, which is not to say that Trump is a fascist. I didn't follow that necessarily. Trumpism involves a cult of the leader and Trump embodies that. I certainly think he's using fascist political tactics. I think there's no question about that. He's calling for national restoration in the face of humiliations brought on by immigrants, liberals, liberal minorities, and leftists. He's certainly playing the fascist playbook. So you see, this was very confusing. You have the nation's top academics um, that have studied fascism for decades all coming out you know, almost uniformly saying that this isn't fascism, this is something else. Uh, Paul Street, who is from um, Iowa City, I, he's a journalist, uh, wrote this book that uh, is called This Happened Here. I think it was self-published the way it feels when you pick it up and look at it. It looks like a self-published book. But he really documents everything that's been happening. And he, and he actually takes all of those arguments that um, you just heard and and lays, it, lays out against him. And he said, here's the false arguments that people are using. He says, first, they expect to expect fascism in 2022 to look like fascism in 1939 Germany or Italy is not a, a legitimate way to think about fascism. There's no way it's gonna look the same. So that's, that's a mistake. Second, he said, requiring all elements of a fascist regime to be in place before it. it's called it fascism is also a mistake. In other words, do we need to wait until there are a death camps or concentration camps uh, before we, we uh, name this? Third, he said, believing Trump isn't a fascist because he isn't an ideologue, even though he has a long history of white nationalism, racism, and misogyny is a mistake. Fourth, claiming Trump isn't a fascist because he hasn't destroyed our democracy yet. False argument. Giving Trump a fascist past because he appears clownish, is narcissistic, is focused on his personal power, or appears inept is also a false argument in his mind. And claiming, claiming Trump shouldn't be labeled a fascist even if he's surrounded by white nationalists and is leading a fascist mob is a mistake. So he's really taking most of those arguments we heard there and, and I think very effectively uh, taking them apart. He then um, really you kind of have these three ways to think about this. So someone could be a fascist if he has fascist ideologies in his mind, if he campaigns using fascist tactics, or if he establishes a fascist state. We can't really know what's in Trump's mind. We do know that he is practicing fascist politics, and we aren't certain where, if he has a second term, what kind of state he would create. It could be a fascist state. We know that the primary thing that fascist politicians do is they create this us versus them. And we've seen this from the, the divisions that he's created, white versus non-white, male versus women, Christians versus non-Christians, common man versus elites, Americans versus immigrants, traditional family versus non-traditional, rural versus urban, heterosexual versus the LGBT community. That is his division that he's been using to, to create the kind of hate that we've seen. Paul Street then in this book goes through and he lists all the things that are consistent with a fascist leader. Support for neo-Nazis, a cult of personality, hate rallies, stoking violence, assaulting the elections, having a white nationalist as advisors, pardoning criminals, immigration raids, electrification of the border wall, separation of families. In fact, he has this whole list. This is a whole bunch more of them that he lists here. I think here's the evidence. Another writer that um, I haven't uh, finished his book, but is uh, Rufus Jimerson, who's written this book called Following the Authoritarian's Playbook, Trump, Nazism, and the New Holocaust. 
And one of the most interesting things in this was this statement, which I had never thought of. He said the 1930 eugenics evolved into herd immunity. He says, it demonstrates that eugenics practiced in the 20s and 30s have evolved into herd immunity to purge the quote, others from the population. This is a biogenetic consequence of the pandemic, politicization of wearing masks, maintain social distance and super spreading to least preferred vulnerable populations. COVID-19 is questioned as being a convenient eugenics tool that can be functioned on a purpose, function on purpose as a means to purify the population from undesirables, blacks, browns, elderly, and disabled. Very interesting uh, concept on, on to kind of the position of uh, Trump and the whole pandemic. Louis Dean Valencia Garcia, um, an academic uh, that studied fascism in Spain, has a much broader definition of, um, of fascism. He said, for years, scholars have argued Donald Trump has X quality, but not Y. These academics looked at the worst case examples where fascism resulted in war and genocide and started their point of comparison from the worst case scenario, rather than considering what does fascism look like before it gains power for a following? What is fascism at its core? And he says a more simplified definition of fascism would be a formula like racism plus anti-intellectualism plus anti-liberalism plus xenophobia plus ethnocentrism and nationalism plus queerphobia and misogyny equals fascism. And he said, while the quantity of each X factor varies, the combination of these in any quantity forms fascism if it becomes the basis of a political party's um, strategy. When you look at all those definitions, racism, anti-intellectualism, and you list Trump's alignment with those, and he, you go down the list and you can see that he has demonstrated that kind of bias all the way down. Umar Haik goes on to say that fascism is best seen as a kind of theft from the nation, a deep and profound theft, the deepest theft of all. It proceeds as theft of rights, theft of norms and values, theft of democracy, and theft of decency and humanity. He also says beyond that, the in-group, the white nationalists in our case, Christian nationalists mostly, proceeds to rob the less powerful than them. Everything without guilt or shame, they steal their dignity, their, their ability to belong, their selfhood, their work, their social milieu. This is a Dr. Seuss cartoon from 1941. I thought it was interesting. Actually, I, I can't quite read the top there because the thing's in the way here, just a minute. Um, America First, which is kind of the pre precursor of um, Make America Great Again, you know, from the 1930s. And it says Adolf the wolf on the cover. And the woman says, um, and the wolf chewed up the children and spit out their bones. But those were foreign children and it really didn't matter. This was doc, one of the Dr. Seuss's anti-fascist cartoons. And it made me think of that mother, that mom, and whether this is kind of moms for America, isn't it? In terms of how they think about uh, gay children in school and African-American children, they're, they're the kind of the foreigners that don't matter. So are we looking at a fascist future? John Adams said, remember, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. There is never a democracy that did not commit suicide. And Abraham Lincoln said, at what point then is the approach of danger to be expected? I answer, if it ever reaches, it must spring up among us. It come, cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we must live through all time or die by suicide. These are pretty sharp guys. <laughs> they, had, they had all been 
studied, you know, democracy in ancient Greece and the, and the classics and really understood power and the, the risks of demagogues and power centers. Nancy Bermio uh, from Princeton kind of put together this list of ways that uh, democracies um, commit suicide. And the first are ways that happened, you know, in really before 1990, um, authoritarian takeovers. The first three are ones that we recognize, the coup d'etat, the promissory coup, which is a coup d'etat where they promised to hold elections after, you know, they immediately promised to hold elections. And the executive coup where uh, the leader just says they're not there, he delays elections. So again, it said, uh, Adam said that, you know, democracies eventually commit suicide and, and uh, Abraham Lincoln said, if we're gonna destroy, if we're gonna be destroyed, it's gonna be from within, basically. Uh, this is a Nancy Bermeo slide. So this is her list of, of ways that democracies kind of commit suicide. Um, like I said, these first groups, the coup d'etat, the promissory coup, when uh, there's a violent takeover, but then a promise to hold elections, or the executive coup when the leader just simply cancels elections. Those are illegal, sudden, violent, and very public, you know. Uh, the, suddenly they are, you see military people in the radio stations and, and they're marching the leader out of the palace. Um, election day fraud is also a sudden thing, but it's hidden, it's stuffing the ballot box. But there are also these more modern ways of uh, destroying a democracy, strategic election manipulation and this incumbent takeover. These are legal, incremental and hidden ways that they do this. It's interesting that if you think about what the Republicans under Trump have done over the past year, they essentially tried a coup d'etat on January 6th. Um, if he would have called, uh, if he would have claimed martial law, he may have made a promise to hold elections in the future. Um, early in the pandemic, he made comments or uh, proposed that uh, elections be delayed. Remember that because they couldn't be administered. And then of course the John Eastman uh, plan was an election day fraud. So all four of those have been attempted. The Republicans have been using strategic election manipulation for decades in their, their voter manipulation and their gerrymandering and their voter suppression. And then this authoritarian, authoritarianization or incumbent takeover is really the, the whole playbook, the whole authoritarian playbook about um, that we'll talk about here in a second. So the incumbent takeover is this middle section. So once the, once the would-be authoritarian gets elected using these kind of fascist tactics, then they go about with these, what the, uh, a lot of the experts have put this list of seven things, which they call the authoritarian playbook to politicize independent institutions, that's particularly the courts. We're certainly seeing that with the, um, the, uh, the judge in Florida and her stopping the investigation, uh, spread disinformation, increase executive power, oftentimes to trying to extend um, the presidencies like Putin did and she did in China, quash criticism and dissent, target vulnerable or marginal minorities, corrupt elections and stoke violence. And then once they're in power, the usual way these authoritarian states stay in power is through coercion or repression that can be overt but mostly it's using weaponizing government authority, using it against political opponents or co-option where they offer state benefits and access to power or a cut of the pie. And then finally, right now, uh, one of the most worrisome parts of the power of these authoritarian is the um, electronic surveillance that is probably the cutting edge of that is in China with device monitoring, social monitoring, facial recognition, GPS tracking and then this community eyes and ears policy. So this is a scary future. And, you know, the crisis in the Republican party, I think right now is which type of authoritarian um, government will emerge if they win. Uh, 
Trump wants to see a, a Putin style personalist strongman um, authoritarian system where the all the power lies in the head of state like Putin has. And he wants to be that person. Uh, Liz Cheney and the and the kind of the regular Republicans who have been pursuing kind of a a um, an author a slow authoritarian takeover want to see us more like Hungary, which is a dominant party state, not a single individual, but a party that controls the country. You can see their uh, appetite for that by the fact they invited Victor Orban to CPAC in Texas and gave him a standing ovation. So. They even have some of their institutes working on trying to justify why that might be a good uh, um, governance policy for us. And then there's the Mike Pence side, which is almost like a Khomeini's Iran, which would be a theocratic state where laws are derived from religious text. And basically the uh, leaders are there just to do God's will. So I, I think we, shouldn't give Liz Cheney a too big of a pass on, on what she's been doing. The thing is with any of these, the more you can see on the left there, the more there's targeting of marginalized people, violence and uh, repression, the more it, it starts approaching a fascist state. Even here in um, Florida, if you look at these seven tactics, um, targeting minorities, older by more minorities is, is part of the playbook here. The Anti Woke Act, the Don't Say Gay Act, um, transgender exclusions from Medicaid, uh, kind of the assault on ex felons by not uh, recognizing their voting rights after a constitutional amendment, and also targeting them for election fraud. The 20 that were, were arrested by the new Election Crimes Department. And then, of course, women in terms of support of anti abortion administration or legislation. What's happening in Florida, of course, uh, happening in every red state where they have total control over the legislature. And this picture shows uh, which states have the trifecta polit uh, political parties. That means the governorship, the Senate, and the, and the uh, House, if that's what they have as a system, are all controlled by the same party. David Pepper, who was the uh, head of the uh, Ohio Democratic Party has written this book called Laboratories of Autocracy, where he really goes into minute detail about what's happening at the state level for taking control and permanent control of um, the party politics. Of course, um, Supreme Court helped this by getting the Voting Rights Act and preventing the preclearance in 1965. And since then, they've been all of these voter ID laws closing of polling stations, new penalties for fraud, all of this suppression activity has occurred because of the coordinated effects of the Supreme Court, the Senate, and the local Republican Party. The problem with fascism is that as it gets more and more intense, uh, you move up what these two models of genocide are. One is called the pyramid of hate, and the other, the 10 stages of genocide. You can look those up and there's good descriptions on the internet about the thinking about how a society moves from simple classification or discrimination all the way into persecution and genocide. Jonathan Greenblatt, executive director of the Southern Poverty Law Center, has written this book that was just published recently called It Could Happen Here. And he goes through all the his concerns from the Southern Poverty Law Center's uh, perspective about uh, the rise of hate and the impact on the future of the nation. Um, I'd like to just read what um, a recent post from um, Haik, uh, Umar Haik said. He said, so what has the GOP really become then? Frankenstein's monster, but for social collapse. Uh, remember how poor Frankenstein was stitched together from corpses? It's exactly the same thing, and I mean exactly. All of these ideas and movements should be dead. Supremacy, fascism, neo-Nazism, theocracy, fundamentalism, medieval, medieval libertarianism, Orwellian authoritarianism. And yet they've been stitched together, inhabiting one form, making up one body. And Trump came along as the electrical spark that animated them all and brought them back to life. 
And he says, but they're really not to life as in seeking to live. They're undead and bent on destruction, destroying what everybody else values and holds dear in a terrible obsessive quest for vengeance and ruin. So should Trump, should Biden apologize? Uh, this was a um, commentary from Charles Blow uh, that was just on September 8th in the New York Times. He said, Republicans have a knack for persuading Democrats to pull their punches. It was the same strategy they used against Barack Obama if he said some, some Americans were bitter and cling to guns or religion or antipathy toward people who aren't like them or anti-immigrant sentiment or anti-trade sentiment as a way to explain their frustration. He was absolutely correct, but in politics, telling the truth can be a sin. It was the same strategy Republicans used against Hillary Clinton after she said, you could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables, right? The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. And unfortunately, there are people like that, and he has lifted them up. Democrats, Democrats have to stop falling for the line that calling out the dangers that some voters present to the country is somehow a divisive, offensive, unfair attack on the innocent. No person who voted for Trump or supports him now is above being named and shamed. Biden doesn't owe Republicans an apology. They owe the country an apology. Well, Dale, thank you very much. Uh, that was very enlightening and uh, it gives us a lot to think about and it's really appreciated that you provided all those terrific uh, references. Uh, I'd just like to make a couple of comments uh, on the coup attempt on January 6th. Uh, we still don't realize uh, quite how serious that was and how close it came to a successful violent coup. I just happened to see a couple of articles today and assuming those are correct, Trump was specifically saying that he was not going to leave the White House. And uh, in my opinion, and this is a personal opinion, if the police had not been able to get control over the Capitol so that the senators and representatives could come back and finish their work, uh, goodness knows what would have happened. Or if the insurrectionists had been successful in grabbing the box containing the certification of the boat, votes, right? where would we have been? And uh, nobody knows, and it's uh, contrafactual, of course, but uh, the possibilities there are just incredibly horrendous. Um, and don't you think, Gene, that we still don't know who else the collaborators were in the Secret Service and other parts of the government that were, you know, those those uh, those uh, um, those text messages that disappeared suddenly about what what happened on the sixth are very, very uh, dis disturbing in terms of other people that could have been involved in the whole. Um, planning of the of the attack and the the attempted coup. Oh, there's no question about it that there was uh, coordinated planning, and and the question really is, how many people were planning, knowing that a coup attempt was underway, and how many were just duped into planning what they thought was a political rally? And uh, I don't know if, if that could be sorted out, but. We have, to give so. the, we have to give the September, the uh, January 6th committee uh, credit for making the attempt. And I think they might. Yeah. I mean, there, there may be some of those that were involved that are having second thoughts about what they were doing. Let's hope so, that there's uh, people at the top that are still committed to democracy and they're gonna squeal on the uh, conspirators. And in my humble opinion, the whole lot of them should go to prison. Yeah. And they certainly should be disqualified from a political office. And that's a position Florida Veterans for Common Sense is taking. I mean, we're taking, we're taking a, a tough position on it because as veterans, uh, we fought to maintain our democracy and we don't want to see it fall apart, as Lincoln said, from the inside. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's just really disgusting to even think about that that's even going on. And so we're working real hard on that. The term we use uh, to describe 
this fascist movement is proto-fascism. Probably the experts are correct. We don't have a fascist regime yet. Right. But we're moving toward it. <laughs> are we going to wait until we do before we... Ex exactly. We have to... And, you know, some people say, why do you call them anything? You know, a duck's a duck, no matter what you call it. But you have to call it what it is. To understand how dangerous it is. And to understand how dangerous it is. And it's clear it's proto-fascism. We just did an article, which you're familiar with, in our uh, Common Sense News. You know, we analogize this proto-fascism movement to a boa constrictor. Mm -hmm. When that rascal has a hold of you, you better get, be getting rid of him. Right. Because if you don't, he's going to kill you. And, and our fellow citizens, I don't think, have understood this. So the work that you're doing, Dale, is really uh, terrific. And we want to thank you very much because it's a great educational service. And now we just need to get people more involved. Well, so, one way they could be more involved is, as you know, and um, we've set up a, a new kind of website organization called Choose Democracy Now or Choose Democracy. But the website is choosedemocracynow.org. And if you go there and sign up, um, you'll get uh, you know, a, a periodic e-blast or a blog. There's uh, resources on a whole lot of books and, and uh, that cover a lot of these topics and recommend, recommendations there. Uh, there's a list of action items that you can take as an individual um, that I think are small steps, but are the kind of things that could bring you kind of in, you know, to be able to take some action to help protect the democracy. And I've been, I've been thinking that most, most people that are worried about our democracy and, and kind of thinking like we are, really are kind of paralyzed. They, you can vote for your pro-democracy candidates. You can give money to them. But beyond that, most people don't know what else they can do. They feel paralyzed to have conversations with their families because they're oftentimes very uh, loaded or conflict, conflicting with members of their family that might be more of a, a Trump oriented. But I think one of the most important things is to just um, step off the curb and, and make it clear that you're a pro-democracy person. And I have three ways you can do that. And I'm wearing one of them. So. Right here is a little button that says protect democracy. And on the website, there's a couple other ones you can choose. One's from the Sierra Club. And another one says something like, this is how a democracy works. Any kind of thing. It's not partisan in the sense that it's not a Trump or a Biden button. It's partisan for democracy. And I think that is what we really need to, to um, show the community that there's a lot of people that aren't gonna give up on democracy easily. Right now, it, it appears that we're passive, we're afraid to step in the streets because of all the armed um, MAGA, nut, MAGA nuts that are down here, a lot of them. Uh, and, and I think that's intentional, you know, this flooding of, of guns in these communities is intended to uh, suppress votes and suppress protests and keep us quiet. And I think the most important thing we could do right now is put a button on, put a bumper sticker that says, Choose Democracy, there's some examples of those on the website or uh, Protect Democracy. Do that and let people get, have a chance to ask you about your feelings and just talk to them about your fear of our democracy and, and see where they're at. We have, to, we have to step off the curb. We have to be more um, visible. And I think a first step is simply to wear, put this on your shirt every day. And, and I wore it to Publix today and, you know, People would look at it and nobody said anything to me yet, but it'll happen. It'll start a conversation, I'm sure. Those are very good uh, points, Dale, because it's clear that the MAGA extremists are a minority, but a lot of our fellow citizens don't understand that. So we have to show uh, our fellow citizens that we are, are the majority. And the one thing we know from uh, the way these uh, minorities take over, you know, the Bolsheviks, they were a minority, yeah. but they used the term Bolshevik, which means the majority. Yeah. And so it's very important to show to our fellow citizens that we are the majority. I'm going to push a little bit of what uh, our group is doing. We really encourage our, our uh, members and supporters to distribute common sense news. I mean, 
we talked a lot tonight about Trump, but DeSantis is in the same mold, oh, yeah. maybe worse. And uh, these laws that you mentioned that he and the MAGA legislature passed, uh, they're taking away our basic freedoms. Some of them. Yeah, I didn't even mention. I didn't mention the Anti Riot Act that they tried to pass that would intimidate a, a peaceful protests in the state. I mean, they're they're. It's almost like they're anticipating uh, the response of the of the population. They're going to say, "We're going to pass all this stuff, and people are going to want to go into the streets and protest." Let's make sure we have some laws in place that make it very hard for them to do that without personal danger. That that's a perfect analysis. And thank goodness a judge found that unconstitutional. I don't know if DeSantis has appealed that to a higher court or not. I'm not familiar with that. I think he may have. Yeah, I think so. so. And the problem is that you mentioned some some expert on fascism said that, you know, once you can get the courts, then you've won. Yeah. yeah. And, and we're a long way down that road. We've got a Supreme yeah. Court that's in the MAGA camp. We've apparently got a district judge in Florida that's in the MAGA camp. And uh, probably our advice, we haven't decided on this, but our advice in this next election, every judge that's up for re-election, turn them out. Yeah. And hopefully we'll have another governor who can appoint better judges. Yeah. And uh, so, Rich, we have thought. Some, I hadn't thought of that. That's a good, good strategy. Uh, Rich, we have some uh, questions and comments in the Q&A. Could you cover those, please, sir? Uh, yes, and I wanted to encourage all the uh, attendees to put their questions in the Q and A uh, box, uh, first one I'll read is um, from Cody Keller, and he wants to know if we can get a copy of your excellent slideshow. Yeah, I I will um, put it in a PDF um, format and send it to you, and you can distribute it to anybody. And I I'm happy for anybody to share it with friends or anyone else. So I'll put a PDF. Um, summary up there. Uh, All right, great. Um, that would be that would be really good, uh, and I'll put it on our website as well. Um, we had a comment. I'll just summarize it. I think uh, you and Jean already uh, covered it. It was from Rhonda Bazzini, but she uh, has a Gertrude uh, Stein quote: uh, "A destroyer is a destroyer, no matter the name." So it's kind of like the duck, you know, if it walks like a right. duck and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Philippe uh, Koenig, uh, not a question, a report on today's DOJ action, sending out 40 subpoenas to Trump close associates and seizing their phones to develop evidence that Trump and his close aides were knowingly working to have the Trump lead, Trump, have Trump lead the January 6th event at the Capitol. Wow. Yeah. No, that January 6th uh, committee is doing fabulous work for the nation. So uh, Steve Martin uh, has a comment. It says, um, and I, anyway, in his opinion, we need to clearly define fascism. Yeah, you know, is, I, I think it was interesting that that uh, Louis, uh, that Spanish academic, probably made something that I'd never heard was he, he listed all of those, uh, that list of things, you know, anti-intellectual, uh, uh, racist and so forth. And he said, and he said, any combination of those, you know, if, if that becomes the policy of a political party, um, you know, is, is kind of a, a good definition of an organization that's moving down a fascist track. I think that was kind of a breakthrough for me because before, you know, everybody was looking for, okay, are they wearing the right kind of shirts? Uh, do they have uh, do they have brown shirts? Uh, you know, they, they keep trying to compare it to what happened in Germany or, um, or Italy. And, and there's just, that's not the way to think about fascism. It's got to be brought up to the, what is the modern equivalent of fascism? And, and um, I think we're seeing it. I think you could almost take what Trump's doing and, and just simply say, uh, let's put together everything he's done, and that is a pretty good definition of fascism. All right. Um, we have, uh, there's something to roll in here now. Ed Braun says, historically, have there been any governments headed toward fascist control that have fallen short of their goals? And if so, how is this prevented? Wow, that's a, that's a really difficult uh, question because... Um, 
you know, in that foreign, foreign affairs article that in 2017 by uh, Steve Levitsky and Ziblatt, where they said, is America safe for democracy? They kind of made the statement they, they haven't seen a country where the majority um, group, the, in our case, the white uh, majority, has lost its majority and become a minority in which democracy has survived. That, that was a very chilling kind of statement they said in that article back in 2017, published in Foreign Affairs. And so they, they made the comment that if we survive this, it's gonna be, it, it will truly be an exceptional action of, of the people to be able to protect our democracy in face of, of powers. And, and I just look at, um, you know, I mean, I didn't, I had some slides. I, I know we didn't have time. I was gonna talk about the fact that uh, now CNN has really been taken you know, the control of CNN now is from this David Malone, who owns a great number of the shares of the, the merged, uh, I think it's called a Warner Discovery, Warner Media Discovery merger occurred. And now David Malone, who is a um, one of these libertarians, he sits on the Cato Institute, which was, was uh, created by the Koch brothers. Um, the Cato Institute is, is an organization that, where the uh, chairman of the Cato Institute uh, sits on the, as a trustee on the Ayn Rand Society. I mean, this is how, how far left and libertarian they are. And this very powerful investor now um, is basically uh, made the statement they wanna make CNN more uh, just to report news and not opinion. So they got rid of Brian Selter and John Harwood both exited after they made the comment that they thought Trump was a demagogue. And that all happened in the last month. And so CNN suddenly, you have one of the major media uh, conglomerates is now under the control of um, the libertarian faction. So you got not only Fox and CNN, but the amount of money and the power that this group has uh, is astonishing. Um, so Steve Martin has, a, um, I want to make sure I get this in, uh, has a simple definition for uh, fascism. He says, uh, first pandering to corporatists, uh, rampant capitalism, belief in restoring the mythic past, whites were supreme, the nation was a hegemonic power, a strong racist, misogynist bent, an alliance of partners with far-right fund religion. Christo fascists. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll just go on another, and Philip, Philippe Cornet uh, adds, another classic test that of, or of Orwell's was about replacing truth with the big lie and convincing the public that the lie is the truth. Yeah. You know, I just, I, there have been a lot of articles about post-truth, you know, and um, I didn't really realize that that post-truth is considered something different than just people lying. It's, it's, it's that there is so much disinformation uh, in, the, in the information uh, atmosphere that, that people actually can't identify truth. It's, it's, it's not just looking at any individual thing. People give up on trying to discern what the truth is because there is so much disinformation. And that post-truth condition setting is something that works for fascists and demagogues because then their followers just turn to them for the answer. It's not, there's no critical thinking about any issue. It's just whatever the leader says. Yeah. In engineering terms, you can't pick out the signal for the noise. Yeah. There's so much noise that it just, a typical jamming technique, you just throw up so much noise. Yeah. People can't receive the signal. Uh, Fred Stokowski uh, comments, a very good book by Milton Myers, They Thought They Were Free, How Fascism Slowly Took Over Unopposed. So I don't know yeah, if you're familiar with that book. Can, can you put that one in the, in the uh, did he put yeah. that in the chat or something? Yeah, sure. It's in the Q&A, but I will okay. copy it over here. Put it out to everybody. While Rich is doing that, I will mention that there's one little thing that we can do as far as dealing with 
the media. Uh, if you watch the media closely, a lot of the commentators, uh, they will continue to use in describing these MAGA extremists, the word conservative. Yeah. And most of them, there's, they're not conservative in the least. No. The last thing that they want to do is conserve our democracy and protect our environment. Uh, they're really radicals. And uh, so I've made it a habit. If I can get an email of a pundit uh, to do two things, send them a thank you note if they mention that they're not conservatives and explain what they are, a MAGA extremist or a MAGA, MAGA radical or something like that. And if they refuse to call them out, like Judy Woodruff on um, uh, National uh, or PBS, she just will not call these radicals anything but conservative. Yeah, I know. It's a, it's a, they, I'm going to keep media hammering media. her with that until she gets the message. And the more media, media has done that. a terrible job of, of helping Americans understand fascism or what's going on. They're just, they, they're, they're it, and it's, you know, at first I thought it was just their own ignorance, but now I think it's our pretty much collusion with the whole thing. I mean, you know, yeah, I not, if not collusion, it's just the lack of courage to call a duck a duck. Yeah. Yeah. And we need to, we need to help them do that. And our members and supporters, we could really pay, play a role with that. Because some of the, the commentators individually, they're very, they're sensitive to the issue but they don't feel like they have support. Yeah. Plus the majority. Uh, I communicated with a commentator from uh, Tallahassee, and uh, he was really happy to hear the communication. And uh, and that makes a difference over time. Yeah. It's a, a cumulative thing, but we all should be doing those little, taking those little steps every day. Great, so, great advice. Uh, Andrew Hall asked, we have a few more questions here. Andrew Hall asked, you support the January 6th investigation. Why do you feel Liz Cheney is an Orban authoritarian? Well, that's, yeah, I think that's a really great question. She is, she is working to defeat Trump. Trump has taken over the Republican Party, right? I mean, he's, he's taken over the traditional, her, the party her father knew and the party her friends are and all that are all, they're no longer in control. Trump has taken it, turned it into something completely different than the, well, not completely different, but different than what she thinks of as a conservative Republican party. And she's trying to wrest it back. But think about her. She voted, what, 93% of the time with Trump during uh, the years, that, uh, during her time when she, her <laughs> Her father was was one of the more famous people for perpetuating a big lie, right? Um, I mean, I mean, she she is she's a great speaker, and and I think she has done a, a fabulous uh, um, um, benefit for the country to expose him. But what she represents and that party is still a party of authoritarian direction. They were going down that path. I mean, you know, it's. It's the party of the Federalist Society that put those people, or those judges on the Supreme Court. Um, it's the party of the Koch brothers and, and the uh, economic, um, what is it called? The ALEC, the American Legislative, Legislative Executive Council. Executive yep. Council that meet twice a year with Republican representatives from the states, you know, legislatures, and hand them bills to take back and, and to pass in their states. Are the Republican representatives of Florida don't work for Floridians. They work for Alec and and the uh, you know the people that own a great percentage of the wealth in this country. Well, Dale, that's a, a very good point that you're making, and and we just have to remember too that perhaps the number two man in the Re MAGA Republican Party now is DeSantis. Yeah, and DeSantis. He's he's right in the footsteps of Trump. Yeah. I mean, in fact, uh, in a lot of ways, DeSantis is more dangerous than Trump because he's probably smarter. Yeah. Did he? Did you see his his, his uh, Trump? He's he's trying he's trying out his Trumpian um, 
impressions when he talked about Fauci that he was at a, some meeting. He said he wanted to pick uh, the little elf and throw him across the river. That's what he said about uh, Dr. Fauci. Pick up the little elf and throw him across the Hudson. That, that really doesn't surprise me because he's campaigning for true MAGA extremists right. all around the country. I mean, some of these people, they're basically saying they want violent revolution. Yeah. But our fellow so, citizens aren't aware of that. And that's our job, Dale, and where yeah. you're doing such a good job. A little well, bit you, about that. You guys too. You guys too. This is so great. we have a couple more here, and then we should okay. probably end here. Uh, this is from Jim Derman. He says, uh, one of the signs that a democracy is failing is the inability to enforce its laws. Trump should have been indicted months ago. Absolutely. In fact, I think the fear of, of what, what he does, one of the things that, um, there's, there's a book called the, uh, the Demagogue Playbook by Eric Posner, who is a law professor, a law professor from the University of Chicago. And in it, he lists kind of the attributes of a statesman versus the attributes of a demagogue. And it's a really good, I'll, I'll include it in my slides. Um, it, it's a little table that I think is useful. But one of the things uh, is that statesmen work through the institutions and demagogues try and destroy the institutions of power that might be in their way. And so everything Trump has been doing, right now he's trying to destroy the power and the credibility of the Justice Department. And so he almost welcomes these kinds of challenges because I think he thinks he has the judges that he needs to protect him. And if he can show the Justice Department is weak or corrupt, it reduces it in this, you know, the country's belief in a rule of law. So it's part of his it's part of their strategy. And that's why they go after universities, other sources of power, and speak to the truth in the media. Um, but He's absolutely right. If you don't apply, if if he isn't indicted on the basis of stealing <laughs> state secrets and probably trying to sell them, what other crime possibly <laughs> could a president he, be indicted for? If he's not so, indicted for attempting a, a coup, I know. I mean, that's yet. treasonous. Yeah, the whole thing. Uh, you know, the one of the things is that you know some people believe that a, a fascist demagogue leader, if they die or they disappear, that the that the um, the movement dies. I don't think that's the case here. I think there's, you know, like you say, you have the DeSantis and you have the other Republican authoritarian personalities. I think that would take this up and continue. Uh, let's see. Uh, I, I'm going to take prerogative and make a comment myself here. And that was uh, back on your slides um, about the signs of uh, fascist state. On this, under the surveillance uh, category, we already have seen in Texas where the item was the uh, using citizens as uh, lookouts and uh, enforcing the rules. We right. already seen this in Texas with their anti-abortion right. law, which right. gives the citizens the right to sue. Uh, abortion providers and anybody that would help a woman uh, get a get an abortion. Um, so I mean that's you know just classic. Well, I think that's a great point, and and I, there are two other books that I would recommend if people haven't read much about the Uyghur uh, um, kind of genocide in China, what's going on in the Muslim community in what used to be East Turkestan, the big province on the uh, uh, west side of of China, where there's a lot of oil and minerals and so forth. The, the, the Chinese suppression of that community is astonishing from a surveillance standpoint in terms of that every member of that Uyghur Muslim group have had to have their have retinal scans, DNA, voice recording, and um, they uh, all of that, they have to go in and give all that kind of information. There are facial recognition cameras at every periodic distance around the entire communities. And there's one of the uh, books is, I survived a Chinese re-education camp by a woman who wrote this book. 
and I'll, I'll put those books in there. But one of the things they do is a member of the Hun Chinese uh, community comes and they're called, their, that's like their uncle, that's the term. Uncle's gonna come and stay in your home for a week. And they come in, the families have to feed them. The, the person staying in their home is a member of really the secret police of China. They, inter they talk to kids about what their parents are doing. They look around the house to see if there's any uh, Korans or any evidence that they're um, of religious artifacts. And they're finding reasons then to send them off to a prison camp or a re-education center. It is, you know, I don't think, if you wanna see where this would all go in terms of surveillance and authoritarianism and a totalitarian state, read a couple of those books. There's another one, uh, and I can't remember the title, but I'll put a, a slide on also on that one. And I, I strongly recommend it to get an idea of what a future surveillance state would be. Right, so, but I think the, the thing there that is, is that the Chinese are using the Uyghurs as a test case to work out the bugs in their system. And ultimately they'll roll out this or try to roll out the system across the whole country, across all Absolutely. China. They know Absolutely. they can't do that initially with Chinese citizens, but they can get away with it against, you know, the Uyghurs. So, you know, and they also, the they also, um, they also, you know, use the Uyghurs as kind of slave labor. They actually let them go work abroad because they have their family back in China that they, um, is kind of their, is the ransom that if you don't return, your family goes to prison or your family disappears. Uh, it's just an absolute chilling, horrifying kind of a, an existence. And I don't think most Americans <laughs> understand the freedoms that we have right now and, and how we're kind of an anomaly on this planet in a way. Um, and I think uh, the last uh, question, comment, well, we have two here. One is from Dennis Blues. He just types Ron to Satan. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, Steve Martin comments, why do Republicans embrace the fascist authoritarian model when we can't even come to a common definition. So I don't know if you want to comment on that or not. <laughs> well, I, I don't think anybody's been able to come to a common definition. You like, like all of those academic books that, uh, you know, I've read most of those that were anatomy of fact, they, they, all of them can't come to a, a satisfactory definition of what it is, but it is kind of like pornography, you know, you know it when you see it. And I, I think that's why uh, people like, you know, Jason Stanley uh, that wrote How Fascism Works isn't a historian, he's a philosopher. And see, he, he probably wrote the best book on that because he's outside of that system and he wasn't trapped into that mindset that fascism has to look like um, all the elements of what Hitler had or Mussolini or Franco. So you don't have to goose step to be a fascist. Not at all, not at all. Well, I think uh, it's already uh, a quarter past almost, so I think we should call it uh, quits. I, I'm surprised we have any audience considering that the, uh, the, the Seahawks are playing right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dale, again, I want to thank you so much. This was uh, just one of the best uh, talks that we've ever had, in my opinion, and I think most of the audience will agree with that. And uh, you're doing wonderful work. And uh, our group and your group, working together and others in the community, we're going to do everything we can to keep our rights from being stolen. Yeah. So and this we have March, a, this well, March uh, Gene, You know, you you and I, Gene, are both on the Speakers Bureau on, on our website. So if people have other clubs uh, that they would like to sponsor us to come and speak, either you or me or anyone else who would like to be on the Speakers Bureau, uh, we're willing to take some of these slides and go out and talk about this. So just let us know. Thanks, Dale. Appreciate that very much. Uh, so sure. with that, we're, we're all on the same page to uh, stop this march of proto-fascism, as we call it. Right. And, uh, so with that, we'll call the meeting to a close. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Rich. Thank, Thank you, Dale. Thank you. our audience. Terrific meeting. Good night. Good night.